Now I'm going to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for today, uh, Mitchell Winnicky. Uh, Mitchell is a solutions engineer with uh, Esri that specializes in local government. He's worked in the GIS realm for over a decade with diverse roles ranging from a cadastral surveyor uh, in Alaska to engineering technician and GIS consultant here in Minneapolis. Uh, he currently lives and works in St. Paul, Minnesota. A little fun facts, uh, he's an avid outdoorsman. Uh, and Mitch has summited Denali on uh, July 4th, 2006 during a solo expedition that took him 20 days. A little bit about uh, his talk today, True Stories of Adventure. So come along on a journey of adventure through a series of short stories from the far sides of the world. During a 60 minute presentation, you will hear stories of Mitch's mountaineering expeditions, uh, life and death on Denali during his 20 day solo expedition, traversing North America's third highest point, an unplanned solo attempt on Mount Rainier, uh, and climbing in Africa's high Atlas range. Mitch will use three maps in Google Earth to show you, uh, show you the routes and camps along the way and also use his own personal media to tell the stories uh, and put you there with us on the mountain. This is a can't miss event. Of course, you're here already, so you're not missing it. For anyone who loves uh, adventure, geography, or has ever wondered what it takes to be a mountaineer. Hang on, because this 60 minute session will be intense. We're giving you a couple more minutes, so we should be able to fit everything in. And then you had a, a little quote on there as well. After a summit, I try not to view it as if I beat the mountain. I view it as a kinship. If you climb, you have that respect. Yep. All right. Well, Mitch, I will hand, I will stop sharing my screen and hand this off to you. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. This is kind of a dream come true for me. So um, thank you for joining us. Come along with the journey of adventure here. Some of you on the line, most of you probably don't know me. Mitch Winnicky, born and raised here in Minnesota. Been in the GIS game for about 16 years with various roles in different organizations, government level, all that. So good morning. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Mitch Winnicky, and this is True Stories of Adventure. Now, before we get started, I'd kind of like to you know, do, you know, set a theme and ask you two questions. So first, what does adventure mean to you? And I'll kind of touch at this. This is kind of the theme of the overall event, and I'll kind of circle back to this kind of in conclusion. And then the other question is, because this is a Minnesota conference, have you ever noticed how many explorers have come from Minnesota? It's pretty interesting. Um, this is just kind of a brief list, but just highlighting a few of my favorites here. Um, in the top center there is Anne Bancroft. So she's widely considered the world's greatest female explorer of all time. On the upper right is Jimmy Chin. He's a, a, a climber, photographer, and cinematographer. He did, uh, he directed Free Solo. Many of you seen that. It's about Alex Honnell. And then if you haven't seen it, um, Meru is also another very, very good documentary about big wall climbing in the Himalayas. And then just kind of a note about Minnesota in general is this, this area really has always been a home to explorers going back to the Ojibwa and Chippewa and then, you know, intermixed with, you know, Minnesota's kind of in that edge of the prairie where it intermixes with the Lakota and Dakota Sioux. Then there were the voyagers that came through and the fur traders and the, the rivers and the high, river highways. So it's always kind of always been a, a uh, an area kind of known for uh, exploration. And then just an honorable mention here in 1936, a gentleman from Minnesota named Jeff Pope and his friend Shell Taylor canoed from New York City to Nome, Alaska, taking them through the Great Lakes, the Can Canadian Northwest Territories, through the Mackenzie and Yukon Rivers to the sea, where they paddled to Nome, Alaska, covering a total distance of 7,100 and 65 miles, which in 1937 was the longest canoe trip to date. Extraordinary. So welcome, my name is Mitch Winnicky. This is True Stories of Adventure. This is gonna be a series of short stories. Uh, I'm gonna do a rundown, quick rundown of the mountains that I've climbed and kind of how we got here today. And then I'm gonna also use a mix of 
Google Earth and personal media to just bring you there with us and show you where we camped and the routes. And then I'm going to go in depth on Tubcall, Half Dome, Denali, Rainier, and Orizaba in Mexico. I'm going to touch on training because people just tend to have a lot of questions about training. And then just kind of touch on the future and kind of what I'm, where my, where my head's at. So this is the complete list of all of the mountains that I've climbed. And so really in the beginning, um, it just kind of started with, you know, living in Minnesota and having the boundary waters and all this accessible nature really in your back door. And, you know, we, we did everything, hunting trips, winter trips, boundary waters trips. I've amassed somewhere around 30 boundary waters trips in my life. And then right before our senior year of college, me and a buddy decided to travel out west and climb a couple peaks out there one of which was the highest point in Montana. And then during my senior year of college, I studied abroad in Africa and climbed, diverged from the group and, group and climbed the highest point in North Africa, which I'll go into in depth later. Finding my way to Alaska and ended up soloing rain, uh, Denali on July 4th, 2006, the highest point in North America. And then 10 years later, really just rediscovering my lifelong passion and kind of going furious at it. So me and a buddy went out and climbed Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in the lower 48, and then turned around two days later and climbed Half Dome uh, in Yosemite Valley. The next year, climbing Mount Rainier, ended up being a solo ascent and descent from Camp Mir. The following year, going, traveling, teaming up with a friend of a friend and traveling to Mexico and climbing the third highest point in North America. Pico de Orizaba. And then right before everything shut down with COVID and all that, uh, have been fortunate enough to travel to Ecuador and climbing the two highest points in that country, Chimborazo and Cotopaxi. So just to do kind of some level setting here, um, I know this is image is a little blurry, but just to do kind of help, I, I took this on Chimborazo on, um, in Ecuador. And I just kind of liked it just to kind of, it does some level setting for what we're going to talk about. So if you'll notice on the left-hand side, it says, you know, mid, mid mountain, that's approximately 9,800 feet all the way to 1,600 feet. You know, the woman on the left-hand side is, you know, that's more of a day tripper, you know, kind of out for casually meandering the lower country, quote unquote. And then on the right-hand side, you'll notice that's for high altitude. So you'll notice right off the bat, we see some glacier goggles, helmet, multiple headlamps probably. You'll notice more layers. Um, he's wearing a buff around his neck to protect from the sun, ropes, climbing harness, various climbing gear and tackle. He's holding an ice ax in his right hand. Those are full-grade mountaineering boots, which cost upwards of $2,000 for boots. And then on his feet, you'll also notice that he's wearing some removable spikes. Those are called crampons. So just kind of how that all comes into play. Let's, let's start the breakdown of, you know, the different peaks here. So first off, you know, what was I doing in Morocco? Well, I went to Gustavus Adolphus College in Southern Minnesota, and they have something called J-Term there. And a lot of people study abroad during that period and during which that time we toured Southern Spain and then most of Morocco. Now I had negotiated an agreement between my professor and me that I would diverge from the group and climb tube call and then meet up with the group after the climb. And he said he loved the idea, but it was almost impossible because of the legality that goes into it. So I had to have create this document. I had to have my parents sign it. I had to have a notarized by a notary public, and then I had to bring it to the dean of students, have him sign off on it, and then have my, before my professor, professor would even entertain the idea. And I, I managed to, to nail it off, um, and I pulled it off, climbing the whole darn thing in one day and getting a taxi cab back to my group the very next day. But before we go in depth on the climb here, I just kind of want to notice something, you know, about the geography of Morocco right now. Um, we kind of notice that the peak is highlighted in the point there, and it's kind of in the center part of the country. And I'd like to highlight that kind of for a reason now. And let me know when you're viewing my Google Earth screen. Just want to make sure all these transitions are seamless.
Are we good? Great. Okay. So I highlighted the peak here, but looking at Morocco's kind of interesting geography on the planet, you'll notice that the high Al Atlas Mountains kind of run east-west here. And it really essentially just kind of protects the, the more fertile north half from the harsh southern Sahara. And that'll, that'll kind of get in, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but <laughs> so before I even got there, the, the, but the transit bus, we were touring with about a dozen other students, which was a big coach bus kind of touring across the country, making various stops along the way. So our primary guide, Aziz, had, had known about my idea and he had contracted through another service to, to find me a ride. And you'll notice where we are here, we're very close to the Marrakesh International Airport. And there's basically just a, a concrete slab and it's just this transit lot and there's just people all around. It's just madness. So may, we had made the prior arrangements to, to find me a ride. And so they basically just dropped me off. He set me up with this other concierge. And so basically what happened, uh, this was all set up through a pre-negotiated price. And basically what happened is as soon as Aziz and my professor and the, the tour bus were out of sight, that man returned my concierge and said, the price has now doubled what we had previously negotiated. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there in this madness transit lot and I just politely smiled. And, yeah, that sounds good. So from there, the driver, the driver took me into the mountains to Imlil for the evening. And we, Imlil is just a tiny little village kind of on the edge of the mountains. And we spent a night there. And then having traveling, you know, Morocco is such a land of distinction. You'll notice that the, the trail essentially just kind of follows the lower country here. And so this corner is, is very interesting right here is because Morocco being such a land of distinctions, you'll notice, you know, in the lower country before this corner, it's more of like a canyon country, like a desert Southwest kind of feel. And then as you round this corner, then you kind of get into the Alpine country. And I'll show you some photos here of exactly what I'm talking about. So this is some personal media from back in the day. So the lower country, as you can see, kind of real desert feeling, you know, kind of canyon country. And then when we make that corner, soon we get into the high country. So some really cool distinctions there. And it just kind of happens. So making our way around the corner the following day. So we woke up real bright and early and then made our way all the way up to Refuge Tubkal. Now, normally climbers would stop at Tubkal here and have a night there. And so normally this is kind of a two to three day climb. And so we essentially just did this all in one day out and back. And so we made it to Refuge Tubkal pretty early. And just some other personal media. And then I'm going to share with you as we as we back out here, I'll draw your attention to the lower side of the screen where it says the refuge is down at the bottom. And then following the red, it'll really give you a good idea before we go into the geography here on Google Earth about what we're kind of getting into. So that's the path to the summit. And then I zoom out here, you can really see what that path looks like. And at the time, there's, this was all permanently glaciated. So there, you're, you're going up glacial couloirs. And the cool thing about the Google Earth technology here is that you can also, you know, see the trails that people took. So this, this is the actual trails themselves all the way to the summit. And the interesting thing about the summit of Tubecall is that there, one, there's this really weird marker there. So it's this iron marker that somebody put up there a long time ago. And so I just got a quick photo up there. But then going back to our conversation about, you know, where the Atlas Mountains were, on the edge of the Sahara and the, the mountain, you know, the mountain ranges is that if we look, this photo is looking northeast. And if we look north by northeast, snow cap mountains as far as the eye can see. But if we look directly south, you'll notice it's completely different. It's the foothills of the Sahara. And then off into the distance is the baking off of the morning sun on the Sahara Desert. So once again, looking north by northeast snow cap peaks and then looking south foothills of the sahara 
into the hot baking morning sun of the Sahara Desert. So I ended up completing that climb and then hiking all out in one day, catching a ride um, back to, I think we were in Casablanca. So catching a ride all the way back to Casablanca that same day. Our next adventure takes us halfway around the world to Denali. Um, but before before I talk about that, I'd like to just briefly touch on, you know, after college, what was I doing? So I made my way to Alaska through a series of internships through an organization called the Student Conservation Association. Um, so I did a series of internships in throughout all of Oklahoma, uh, Catalina Island off the coast of Southern California, and then making my way to Anchorage, Alaska. So if anyone's on the line right now and they have like, you know, children or or nieces or nephews or someone like that in their life that they might not know what they want to go into after college, um, but they're more, you know, biologically oriented or science oriented, this might be a, a good avenue to go down because you also get the AmeriCorps awards, help you pay down some of that student debt at the same time. So I just kind of wanted to mention that. So Denali, making my way to Denali, I had some really big international plans, wanted to make it to Himalaya, and I needed to do something that was going to put me on the map. And so I signed up for a 20 day, uh, it took me 20 days, mainly most of which was spent solo through climbing with three separate groups. I actually celebrated my uh, 24th birthday at 11,000 feet and at eventually summiting on July 4th, 2006. I was on Denali with two climbers, a married couple that I'd met on a climbing forum. Now, the plan was for us to travel as a group on the established and famous West Buttress route from base camp at 7,200 feet all the way to camp three at 14,000 feet. There, we would leave one of the climbers, the wife, to descend back to base camp with a guided group. And then he and I would proceed to the summit as a two-man team. And I like this image because it gives us a really good idea here of exactly what we're looking at. So I'll just kind of run you through it, flying to base camp, 7,200 feet, and then all the way up to, you know, past camp one up to Calhetna Pass is essentially the glacier. You're not really on the mountain, really, until you're past Calhetna Pass. 11,000 feet, camp two is the cloud level. And then camp three at 14,000 feet, you're above the cloud level and high camp is 17,000 feet. On Denali, you fly into base camp at approximate elevation of 7,200 feet to the proverbial shanty towns of caches and tents. Now, what's cool about this too, is you can actually see the shanty town here. So you can see actually the plane here, as well as all the the runway and the shanty towns. And what else I also, I also like about this technology here is the ability for us to digitally look at something like Mount Hunter here, and then take a look at my own personal media from base camp. And you see all the caches on bottom and Mount Hunter in the background. You'll notice the sled there too. Um, people tow sleds from base camp to with gear and a pack all the way up to uh, camp, two, camp two at 11,000 feet. So what you do is yet you wait till about midnight before you start traveling. And that's to ensure that the whole glacier is completely frozen and all the snow bridges are frozen because the, the lower glacier especially is riddled in the summer months, especially now with increased warming with crevasses. And when you pass over a crevasse, there's nothing underneath it. And so when I say snow bridge, that's literal. It's a bridge of snow across the crevasse that then you, you're able to cross over the crevasse. 
So it's important that you wake up and you travel essentially during the middle of the night, making our way to camp one on kind of the upper Calhetna glacier, somewhere around four or five, 6 a.m. So once again, we can zoom in and kind of see all the camp there. And then my own media from the mountain. You'll notice we're towing very big sleds. The sleds are completely loaded down as well as a pack on your back. And the conditions on the, the lower glacier can actually be pretty nice, interestingly enough. Traveling with my group to Camp One on the upper Calhetna Glacier and staying there for a night. Then the following day, traveling to Camp Two at the cloud level, where we were three days into the climb here where the plans changed. And my group of two informed me that they would be ending their trip immediately and descending as soon as possible. Today was my 24th birthday. The couple held up their end of the bargain, lending me a few pickets, which are safety devices, and their best tent. Camp two is situated at the cloud level at 11,000 feet and receives massive amounts of snow. Now, completely alone, I was snowed in for four days. Three days, that is. And you'll see, this is also a critical point on the mountain because as we kind of noticed earlier, it's critical geography is now we're definitively on the mountain. We're kind of off the lower glacier and we're definitively on the mountain. And the picture we spoke of at the beginning, now this is people leaving uh, 11,000 feet and you'll notice no one's towing a sled anymore. Everyone leaves their sleds and they proceed up with just packs from there. So normally climbers, like I said, will tow a sled to 11,000 feet and cache them there and then continue with large packs for the remainder of the trip. Being alone, I was forced to carry my pack and tow a sled all the way up to camp three at 14,000 feet. And so this is, once again, the photo, another photo we saw at the beginning taken from 14,000 feet. And you'll notice now we're definitively, if you look on the lower left-hand side, we're definitively above the cloud level now. We're above the clouds. Weather's actually fairly pleasant here. And then you can see what people do, put their tents in there is kind of some, some holes, essentially, to block the wind. And... A group of two climbers had noticed me making the pull to 14,000 feet and keeping pace with everybody else. <clears throat> and they would eventually ask me to join their team for a summit push. Bobby was an international guide and a cell phone businessman with big mountain experience all over the world and an affluent clientele list whom he was guiding on this trip. Greg was an orthodontist and owned several practices on the East Coast. Together, now as a team of three, we made the push from 14,000 feet up the fixed lines of the head wall and onto high camp at 17,000 feet. Now, just touching quickly on the head wall here, this is really the only technical portion of Denali. It's simply a fixed rope that goes up the mountain that you're able to attach a carabiner or a sender into and basically follow the stairs up and the rope makes sure that you won't perish to your death. The other thing I'll make mention of here is temperature control because on Denali, things can change so quickly that you need to be able to manage your temperatures. So what I mean by that is you can see, you know, I've, you can see my shorts here and I'm bare skin there up to my arms. And so if it's 40 degrees now and you're sweating, you need to be able to control that temperature because 15, 20 minutes from now, it might be 10 below and snowing and sleeting. And you don't want to be throwing a coat over so sopping wet skin. That's a recipe for disaster. We were snowed in at 17,000 feet for two days before there was a, a weather window and we took it. So here's the 17,000 foot camp. And then from there you climb up to Denali Pass. We took the weather window climbing to Denali Pass at 18,000 feet.
as we ascended this part of the section of slope, <clears throat> there was a Korean teamer that was struggling, and one person in particular. Passing teams on this section of the mountain is ill-advised, but we had no choice as the person was in distress. I would later find out that this man ended up dying when the chopper came to get his body later on in my climb. We climbed up to Denali Pass and then about an hour past Denali Pass before the weather turned foul and we were forced to turn around. So I'll show you a few things here. One, as I zoom in, you'll notice you can actually see climbers on the trail. So all these dots and shadows are all teams of climbers. And you'll get an idea of exactly how steep this is. And I'll share some personal media with you once again. This is one I took all the way up. You can see the moving right to left, the trail going up to Denali Pass. And then this is just another one that I stole online just to give you an idea of how really steep it is. And then finally drawing your attention kind of to the turn of the lower part where there's kind of a this big block of ice. As we descended a notorious and steep section of the mountain known as the Autobahn shown here, <clears throat> the lead climber, Bobby, came to the first anchor point in the mountain, which is essentially just a, a safety mechanism with a carabiner that's that's bolted into the mountain so that you can you can only if you're if you put your rope in there you can only fall as far as the next person so it's a safety mechanism but before bobby could attach his rope the trail gave way and bobby fell like a pet like he fell backwards down the mountain fell backwards being the middle climber in the group i could barely recognize what was happening as the whiteout continued to consume us falling i screamed as i jammed my ice axe into the mountain and i waited but the way Bobby fell was like a pendulum, which allowed for considerable slack in the rope and for him to gain momentum against us. And soon the rope grew taut, ripping me off the mountain. I remember falling head over heels for what seemed like a very long time and thinking, I'm going to die. Greg was in the rear and he said he saw the whole thing go down and he said to himself, oh, shit, this better work. Greg in the rear jammed his ice axe into the mountain and braced for impact. This allowed just enough time for me to dig my ice axe in as I continued to slide down the mountain, allowing for a self-arrest, which in turn arrested the lead climber's fall, who was now several, yard, several hundred yards down the mountain. Now, lying flat against the wall of the mountain at approximately a 50-degree angle, I caught my breath. And then I felt the whole ice sheet that I was on slide down about two feet. Avalanche. This time the sheet held tight and we hightailed it back to the trail and downwards to 17,000 feet where Bobby and Greg informed me that their climb was over. This night I suffered acute mountain sickness with what I'd characterize as slight cerebral edema marked by extreme headache, bloodshot eyes, slight ataxia, which is difficulty carrying a conversation. And I recall Bobby asking me a lot of questions that night and refusing to let me sleep until I drank a substantial amount of water. After a night of rest, we descended back down to camp three at 14,000 feet where the rest of my gear was cached. And there we split up. Once again, alone at 14,000 feet, I rested for a day before making the climb back up the fixed lines of the head wall and back to high camp at 17,000 feet, but this time completely solo. It was my second time at high camp that I encountered the worst storm of the expedition, and this time it buried in my, me in my tent for four days. I didn't even have a shovel, so I'd have to ask the teams around me to borrow theirs every two to three hours so that my tent wouldn't be buried under the storm. If not, I knew that I could fall asleep and die of hypoxia because I would literally, the tent would be buried under feet of snow. The scene at high camp becomes frantic when the weather window clears and everyone rushes for the summit. 
Being alone, I waited at high camp to follow a guided group and see who I could team up with. And there was a team of two guys in their late 20s and whom I had borrowed their shovel from, so we roped up together, proceeding up the mountain as the last group to leave high camp that day. Up the Autobahn to Denali Pass at 18,000 feet, past where the Korean climber had perished, and past the section where I had almost lost my life a few days prior. By the time we reached Denali Pass, we had caught up with the other guided groups. And at this point, I had basically traversed the upper half of the mountain twice, which made me considerably more fit. So I chose to unrope, unrope once again and proceed solo because I was making, maintaining a pace about double that of the next fastest person on the mountain. Should be seeing a video now. At, uh, about 19,400 feet, somewhere around there. Uh, just to my left here is uh, Archdeacon's Tower. You can see right there. And this flat space, we have the football field. Up top of that is the summit. And that hill right there is Pig Hill to gain the summit ridge. Scenery's beautiful. I'm solo in it right now. It's a little bit faster than the other guys. Feeling pretty good. Okay, so there's the football field. It's this weird flat expanse at 19,000 feet. And then this hill right here, as I mentioned, is Pig Hill. And then you can see all the trails going up leading to the summit. As I made my final push up Pig Hill, I could feel the summit within my reach. Now within 10 minutes of the summit, I passed another group of three climbers. And in this case, the man was vomiting and yelling to his guides, just get me to the top. No, we got to get you back down. I heard in the background as I continued my press for the summit. On July 4th, 2006, not long after passing the group of three, I achieved the summit and for a period of time was the only person to stand atop North America. Twenty thousand three hundred twenty. A dream fulfilled. A goal complete. Coming down Pig Hill right now. Uh, don't exactly know what time it is. I know a storm blew in. Pretty fierce. It looked like the apocalypse up there. It was absolutely phenomenal. The only bad thing about being the only man on north on the top of North America is there's no one there to take your picture. <laughs> so here's we see it. That's what mark, <clears throat> marks the summit. And I didn't take time to do any of that because being solo, I was just hyper aware of the gravity of climbing solo. So I just wanted some pictures. I didn't take time to sign the summit log or anything like that. Just kind of get up and get down and get the heck out of there. I quickly descended, making it back to high camp at 17,000 feet, a whole four hours ahead of the next fastest group. All the while, while having to traverse the same stretch that had almost taken my life a few days ago, but this time doing it completely alone, as no other groups, the groups were hours behind me. I made it back to high camp and rested there a night before continuing my descent. The next day, descending to approximately 9,000 feet on the lower glacier before I was confronted with a huge crevasse field. Not wanting to pass the crevasse field alone, I camped there in, for a night before, before another team reached me. We roped up together and continuing, and we roped up together and continued descending back to base camp as a team. I was both mentally and physically exhausted after my 20 days on the mountain, and my feet were borderline succumbing to trench foot. The next day, I flew off the glacier to Talkeetna, where I called my mother, and then took a much-anticipated shower, which took close to two hours. Thinking back on my journey, I try not to view it as a victory over the mountain. I view it as a kinship between the mountain and I. 
if you're going to climb, you have that respect. So um, at this point, I'll, I'll turn things over to Katie real quick. Um, just for one other thing that uh, after, after I got done with Denali, I was still completing some time in Alaska um, as a cadastral survey technician. And then um, um, made had a scenario that happened to me here. So Katie, if you wanna go ahead and take it away. Yep, I'll read this for you. All right, so Tangle Lakes, Alaska, September 3rd, 2006. After college, I was working as a cadastral survey technician in Alaska for the BLM via AmeriCorps. I was sitting in the lodge after a long day of work surveying in central Alaska, and a man came in screaming needing medical assistance. At the time, I was training for my first responder certification, so I immediately went into action. As we raced down the road, he briefed me on the situation. A 57-year-old overweight male was changing a tire and fell back and hit his head. They said he had a pulse, but his breathing was labored. Well, when I got there, I found no pulse or breathing. I grabbed the only other uh, people at the scene and requested they confirm. I then began performing CPR on this man, which lasted for approximately 70 minutes before the medevac could fly in from Fairbanks and take over. By then, a small crowd had gathered, and the family of the man had to physically remove their mother from the scene because the entire time she had been clutching his hands uh, and speaking in discernible tongues. We watched as they loaded him up and flew off to try to continue to save his life. Back at our lodge, I sat on the floor. I was physically and emotionally depleted. My knees and the tops of my feet were scraped and bloody due to wearing shorts and sandals while performing CPR on raw gravel. The foreman of Bureau of Land Management handed me a beer, which is considered extremely uncommon, and unprofessional within government work, and said, you did everything you could do. After I cleaned up, our team went back into the lodge for dinner. The owner, Nadine, came running out of the back room yelling, I just got off the phone with the hospital. They have a pulse. They can detect brain activity. He's going to live. While it is a relief to know that he lived, I do not know the quality of life that he ended up with, nor do I know the gentleman's name. I am proud to know that I was able to help, even though helping one person might not change the whole world, uh, but it could change the world for one person. I carry this story with me as a reminder uh, to always try my best and to have hope and the very last line is cut off on my screen. I'm sorry. Because tomorrow is not guaranteed to any of us. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. So it took me about 10 years to kind of come back to mountaineering. And uh, I wanted to go over the cables with Half Dome with you. Because one, I think it's one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. And two... I think it's achievable for anyone. And so if you're on the line right now, kind of thinking like, oh yeah, you know, this sounds, sounds well and good, I, but I could never climb Denali, you know, like th this section's for you then. <clears throat> so it's funny how many people, you know, Half Dome here is one of the world's most recognized images. Everybody knows, you know, it's heard of things like Yosemite, Yosemite Valley, Half Dome, El Capitan, but doesn't exactly know where it is. <laughs> Yosemite Valley, sits approximately four hours directly east of the Bay Area. Now, the route itself goes around the back side of the mountain and then travels through several mountain valleys up into the high country. There are two separate climbs. The, the first one is to achieve the subdome, which is the smaller of the humps on the far side. Then there's the cables which are steel cables and wooden planks placed along the dome to assist hikers to the summit in the summer months. The cables are removed every October and replaced every May. Permits are given on a lottery basis starting in March, so get in early. Note it is highly unlikely 
that during peak season, summer months, that you would get a permit Friday to Sunday. And the park also offers, offers limited same day permits on a first come first serve basis. The hike takes between 14 and 16 hours, gaining an elevation of around 4,800 feet, rising to a maximum elevation of 8,842 feet. And it took me and my partner 10 and a half hours to climb. Just kind of showing you some <clears throat> my favorite media from the mountain. On the left-hand side, that's my buddy Steve. And then right in front of him, you'll notice the cable is kind of going up. And then on the right-hand side, I'm going to play a quick video here. And so I'm going to pause it real quick. There we go. And we can see, kind of get an idea of just how, how steep the cables are. And so going back to that original image, you know, the, the cables get us to the top. So going back to this original image, everyone has seen Half Dome. Let me draw your attention to the very top, that very teeny, teeny, tiny little lip out there. That's where we're standing here. So we're out on that little ledge. And then the cliff you see in the far background there, that is the nose of El Capitan. So going back once again, seeing that the, the nose, the little lip way out there. And then me and Steve standing out on the lip. And then just some other media here. This one's pretty cool because it's coming down. So you can get an idea of right here, kind of how steep it is. Looking up, we'll see clouds rest up into Yosemite Valley there. And then I'm going to pause it here at the end for you because it gives us a good idea. You can see there's a climber coming up and it gives us an idea of kind of the maximum pitch that we're working with. And also make note, I saw a lot of people with rock climbing harnesses on and carabiners and short ropes. So every little section there, they would just clip in and clip out. So for that added safety thing too, that's totally doable as well. I saw a lot of people doing that. And then on the right-hand side, there's the sub-dome there. And then from the bottom, looking up. So a pretty cool view of some climbers heading up. OK, moving on. 2018, Mount Rainier, the Ric Flair incident. So many of you, probably a lot of you on the line, don't know who the guy on the right is. Uh, he's an old pro wrestler by the name of Ric Flair. Um, he was kind of one of the first to be very extravagant, extravagant and always talk about how cool he was. Um, and this will kind of come into play a little bit later. So just, you know, if you're wondering what <clears throat> a normal timeline looks like um, for Mount Rainier, this is what I put together for our team. So we'd fly in basically and start hiking that same day, um, making our way on day two to the Ingram Flats around 11,000 feet. And then day three, four, and five were day three on June 18th was the summit day, and 19th and 20th were reserved for contingency days, inclement weather days, et cetera. A lot of people wouldn't build in uh, that type of contingency um, because the weather's relatively stable in Rainier this time uh, during the summer months. Um, but I just, I didn't want to leave there without summiting because we, because of some reason we didn't build enough contingency days in. So we'll head back to Google Earth here and let's head off to the Ingram Direct Trail. So just kind of taking a step back real quick, if for those of you that don't know, um, it's, you know, a couple hours southeast of Seattle is Rainier. And on any given day, if the, if the clouds are right, Rainier, it can actually dominate the skyline pretty well in Seattle. So the trip started off pretty well, I'd say. Um, on the way out of town, I scored us some exit row seating on the flight out. I talked my way into a free upgrade from the rental car facility. We made our way to the nearest dispensary and then picked up a 12-pack of Budweiser Tallboys to drink on the way. 
We made final preparations and reconfigured our packs while slamming beers in the park rangers headquarters. So you start off at 5,500 feet here at Paradise Village, and you'll see here's the Paradise Ranger Station. Directly behind that is the Paradise Climbers headquarters. And that's where we were just uh, reconfiguring our packs. And we asked them like, hey, can we drink these beers in here? And they're like, yeah, we don't care. So we're <laughs> packing up the rest of our gear and reconfiguring our packs and slamming beers. <laughs> So here's our group to begin with. It's left to right. It's Steve, Blake, and myself on the far right. And Mount Rainier in the background. We started out hiking from the Paradise Trailhead at 5,500 feet the same day we flew into Seattle. Our three-man team hiked for about four hours and then spent the night somewhere around 8,000 feet, just at the base of the Mir Snow snowfield just past panorama point right in time too soon after a calm evening dinner came sideways sleet and powerful winds in the morning it was so clear that we could see mount hood in oregon which was over a hundred miles away so we could see there's in the upper right hand corner Near the clouds, you'll notice that's Mount St. Helens. We could see Mount Hood, and then there's another mountain close by called Mount Adams, and we could see all three of them this morning. That mo the next morning, making the hike, hike up the Mir snowfield to Camp Mir at 10,000 feet, where we were forced to make camp because Steve had aggravated a calf injury that he'd suffered while in the line of duty as a local firefighter several weeks before the trip. We agreed that the next morning, Blake and I would attempt this summit as a two-man team. So here's a view from Camp Mir. <clears throat> There's Mount Adams from Camp Mir at 10,000 feet. And then just kind of an idea of your typical you know, glacier get up. You're going to have glacier goggles of some sort. I like a beanie because I'm bald with a big hat. Um, and then I've kind of grown accustomed to the full Arab Shemag because you can kind of, when it's, you know, you're at 10,000 feet, you're two miles up, the sun's pretty impactful. So we can see Camp Mir here. There's a ranger station here. And then you can also notice the trail carving around left to right around this big switchback area on the right-hand side known as Cathedral Gap. Blake and I, woke up around midnight we quickly geared up and departed camp about an hour past everybody else as the last group to leave camp that day now this was done on purpose to ensure that we would follow the trail of headlights headlamps up the mountain and that we were always on the proper route steve helped us get ready that morning and before seeing us off he shook my hand with an extra long pause and he said promise me you won't do anything foolish blake and i traveled up the mountain in the morning, past Cathedral Gap, and on to the imposing Ingram Snowfield. And I'll draw your attention to the lower right-hand side of the screen, and you'll notice this little peak called Little Tahoma. There is a spire of rock called Little Tahoma Peak that ascends to 11,138 feet. It's almost a perfect triangular spire, and when the sun comes up over the eastern horizon, it rises behind Little Tahoma and begins your day with one of the most beautiful sights you will ever see in your entire life. And it was at this point that we simply knew that this day was meant for us. But it was tw around 12,000 feet where things began to go wrong. The normal route up Mount Rainier is known as the Disappointment Cleaver Route or the DC Route. <clears throat> Once on the Ingram Glacier, you make it to around 12,000 feet before curving right and ascending a rocky outcropping known as the Disappointment Cleaver, then switchbacking your way to the top. The Ingram Direct Route is a lesser known route that is used by climbers in the first part of the season. The route travels directly up the Ingram Glacier in a straightaway and vertical fashion over several crevasses and icefall areas, increasing in angle towards the top. On June 18th, 2018, this was the longest 
the Ingram Glacier direct route had persisted in the last 12 years and was the chosen route on this day. When the sun came up, it exposed just how massive the glacier was. Finally, we could see our challenge and not just feel its ominous presence. Now here's Blake and I, and before I zoom in here and we, we see that's the route pretty much going straight up the Ingram Glacier and that rocky outcropping on the far right-hand side is the DC, the cleaver, disappointment cleaver. Now, before I zoom in here, I just wanna let you know there's approximately 30 people clearly visible in this photo. So we're gonna zoom in very carefully here. And I'm gonna draw your attention kind of to the upper half of the mountain and you'll start to see dots all over the mountain. These are generally teams of four. So you can see there's a lot of people on the mountain. And once I zoom out again, you can see here just how the scale of things that we're working with. It was at this point that Blake informed me that he thought he might be having a panic attack. I mentioned that we would stop soon for a snack, drink, and rest. But very soon after this, he collapsed on the trail. We immediately rested there, refreshing with sugary drinks and high calorie snacks. We didn't really, we didn't really talk much during this time. But as I sat there, I knew that today would be my only chance this season to summit Mount Rainier. Now, having seen the upper part of the mountain in person, I knew that there was no physical way that Steve could do it. I didn't trust to be on the same rope as Blake and he could go no further. And the chances of roping up with another team and successfully summiting in the days to follow would be extremely low. I hate making critical decisions, decisions alone. There was limited time to work with because of our location on the mountain and a decision needed to be made. We agreed to unrope both going in opposite directions. Blake would descend at his own pace back to Camp Mir, and I would race to the top in an attempt to rope up with another team. And I was literally running up the mountain at this point until my heart felt like it would burst and my battery and my, my muscles pumped battery acid. And this was done in fear that all the other groups would already be too far up the mountain and that I wouldn't be able to rope up with anyone which is exactly what happened, leaving me to ascend the upper mountain solo, as no one else was in sight distance of me. As I neared the uppermost part of the climb on the steepest part of the section of the entire route, my right crampon came loose, cause, having to make me have me make the repair in the worst possible spot of the entire route, completely alone. In fact, it was so steep that I had to use my ice axe to carve out a place to stand and then I'd carve out a place to sit because, to make the repair because it was so steep. There's nothing up here you didn't see on Denali, I, I kept telling myself. And if you let the best, your emotions get the best of you at a time like this, you're finished. And at this point, the mountain and I were playing for keeps. If a solo climber were to fall on this section of the mountain and didn't catch themselves on the initial fall, there would be no chance of survival. Passing over the rim of a, a volcano onto a frozen caldera is an interesting feeling. Mount Rainier requires you to cross over a frozen caldera, volcanic crater, and then ascend another 200 or so vertical feet to Columbia Crest and the true summit. By this time, the guided groups had already made the summit and were resting before making the trek downward. And for a period of time, this left me as the only person atop Mount Rainier. And that's at the crater rim with Mount Adams to, my, to our right. And I'll share with you one of my other favorite pieces of media. And you'll notice a couple things right away before I press start here. I want you to notice this is from the inside of the crater. You'll notice the venting coming from the volcano. It's there's steam emanating from right below me. So these rocks are kind of nice and warm. 
and then the people passing across the crater, which is pretty cool. So look for those two things. And then just to our right here would be then up that hill would be the true summit Columbia Crest. Soon after, I had a quick rest and then made my way up back across the frozen caldera, <clears throat> now ahead of most of the guided groups. I began descending downward until confronted by a slowly moving guided group of approximately four people making their way around a crevasse, an icefall area. At which point, I just deemed it safer to descend at my own pace, making trail at a much faster rate than anyone around me and passing multiple other groups on the way down, making my way over two crevasses and downward past the Ingram snowfield onto Cathedral Gap, where I could see Camp Mir in the distance. But before I did that, I had to cross over this kind of sketchy area really all by myself. And I'll give you an idea of what we're looking at here. So you should be viewing YouTube video right now. And there were two crevasses. One was on the upper side of the mountain. second one on the lower part of the mountain. So as I pause it here, you can see this is literally a snow bridge. There's nothing underneath it. There's nothing to the sides of it. It's literally a piece of snow lodged in between the crevasse. <sighs> So then rounding Cathedral Gap here, where I could see Camp Mir in my sights. And I will never forget the feeling of seeing Camp Mir again, being all alone, the feeling of safety, achievement, and anger all at once. Now, before the guides take anyone up the mountain in the morning, the route is scouted out by either professional guides or the rangers themselves. And when I had been traveling up the mountain solo, soon, and af soon after Blake and I had split up, I had passed two guides scouting the route. <clears throat> they were descending as I was ascending, and we'd passed each other on the same trail. Solo climbing on Mount Rainier is strictly prohibited by the park superintendent and comes with severe penalties. No doubt these guides had noticed me climbing solo and tipped off the park rangers that someone was alone that day. So as I made the turn around Cathedral Gap and into the glacier that holds Camp Mir, there was a park ranger waiting for me. And as I entered camp, he'd intercepted me directly on the trail. Where are your climbing partners, dude? And I pointed to Blake and Steve, who were now only about 20 yards away as I'm we're doing the walk and talk. I'm continuing to walk into camp. <clears throat> what happened? He said. And I told him an exaggeration of the truth that Blake had a panic attack and I uh, unroped and roped up with another team thereafter. And then he started to really like grill me on the situation. Like, who did you rope up with? What were their names? What were they wearing? What guide service were they with? And by this time, we're making the final steps into my camp. And I began peeling off, you know, the layers of clothing. It's hot. You know, I'm, I just got done with this climb. And now when I achieve a summit, I usually record a video at the top, like a short speech. Muhammad Ali quotes are common for me to recite. But this time, I had memorized an old wrestling skit done by Ric Flair. So it was fresh in my memory. Some things in life you just can't explain, and I simply don't know where this came from. But as the ranger continued to grill me on my situation, I interrupted him emphatically and said, Do you know who you're talking to? And he stopped like dead in his tracks immediately, and he stared at me. And I said, 
You're talking to the Rolex wearing, diamond ring wearing, kiss stealing, whoa, wheeling dealing, jet flying, limousine riding, son of a gun, and I'm having a hard time keeping these alligators down. Okay. You talk. So the only difference is at the end I didn't say, and I'm having a hard time. I said, I'm having a hard time keeping myself under control. And I just screamed as I spiked my ice axe into the mountain. Solo on Rainier, add it to the list. And I shouted this so that the dozens of people in Camp Mir could hear me. And the ranger, he takes two steps closer to me and he pulls down his sunglasses and he says, congratulations, have a nice day. And then he walks away. And, you know, I'm walking around camp. I'm like, woo, you know, I'm still flying high after this. I didn't notice the reactions of Blake and especially Steve. Now, this should be a time for great celebration. But Steve was sitting there with his hands clenched together and this like bewildered look on his face. And I just looked at him, I go, what is your problem? <laughs> and he goes, Mitch, that ranger has been sitting in camp with me all morning, grilling me on your situation. That little book that he had with him was his fine sheet. And I watched him write your name in it, not even 20 minutes ago, exclaiming that he was forced to fine you. And you just shit talked your way out of it. Soon after this, the group informed me of their intentions to hike out that same day. I agreed, but only if they gave me proper time to rest and melt drinking water for me. About an hour later, we packed up the remainder of our gear and departed down the Mir snowfield, ending our adventure at the Paradise Trailhead around 5 p.m. As we made our way into Tacoma for the night, the effects of altitude began to catch up with me. Nausea, headache, cough, lack of appetite, and general confusion are some of my personal symptoms. Sometimes my kidneys even hurt the days following extreme stress because the adrenal glands sit directly above the kidneys. Four days after my ascent of Mount Rainier, the Ingram direct route collapsed entirely and closed to climbing for the season. Two weeks after this, the upper quarter of the Ingram Glacier calved off, sending skyscraper-sized blocks of ice down the mountain, destroying everything in its path. This event was so large that it was picked up by NOAA seismographs monitoring tectonic plate and volcanic activity. Amazingly, nobody was on the mountain at the time when it happened overnight, because you're usually climbing during the night, and no one was hurt. All right, that brings us to Orizaba. Um, we're entering the hour mark, so I'm wondering if this would be a good time to, we've got about 15 minutes left, if this would be a good time for us to take a quick two minute break. Um, we do have sessions that do need to start right at 1040. Um, okay, let's hang in there then, and I'll try and finish up as quickly as I can. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> Orizaba, let's go right into it here, and we'll start the flyover. Pico de Orizaba is the third highest point in North America and the second most prominent volcanic peak in the world. It is located four hours southeast of Mexico City and rises to an elevation of 18,491 feet. Now for this climb, I teamed up with a friend who, a friend of a friend who was also into climbing and we planned this trip to Mexico. <clears throat> In climbing, it's not always about what you do, it's, it's sometimes more about how you do it. And for this time, we wanted to do something special. So we ended up planning a traverse of the mountain. And a traverse is defined as to travel or pass across, over, or through. And for this one, as you can see, we would go up the north side and then down the south side. <clears throat> and we spent a few days at 10,000 feet uh, at, with the guide service acclimatizing before taking a four by four road to Piedra Grande. Now, Piedra Grande is a refuge there, requires uh, nothing. There's no permits to climb here, nothing. It's absolutely, all, you know, 
wilderness, if you want to call it that. It's completely open to the public. And actually, the north side here is considered fairly safe. But going back down the south side was not recommended by the guides because it's in an unsafe um district but we didn't we didn't really care that much so here's a quick view of piedra grand at 14,000 feet and then as you can see here the trail following up this canyon here so we started out hiking around midday and we made it to this crux in in the uh in in the climb right here. And the reason this is so important is number one, this is the only spot to pass through right here. So if you miss this section of the climb and you went beyond it or before it, you're pretty much hosed. The second most important part of this was the fact that what lies beyond this, this black part here is known as the labyrinth. Now the labyrinth is an infamous part of the climb, which is a confusing maze of rock and ice that is literally pushed out by the Yamapa Glacier. We camped there for a night, and they gave us the opportunity to scout the route ahead of time, um, being that we would do it in the dark the next morning. <clears throat> and so here's a quick photo of our camp at 15,000 feet looking up on the upper left-hand corner. That's the labyrinth. And it is very deceiving because even though some of these rocks might look small, uh, they're all between 10 to 20 feet tall. So you can't even like get over the next one to look at your next view. It's, it's very confusing. And then another one kind of looking north by northeast to where you can actually kind of see the curvature of the earth, which is pretty cool. We woke up around midnight and made our way up the Yamapa Glacier where we could see where we wanted to make it for this sunrise shadow event. So making our way up to the upper part of the mountain here on the Yamapa Glacier, Mexico's one and only permanent glacier. This is a picture looking east, so we can see the clouds rolling in off the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the reason we wanted to be very high up on the Yamapa Glacier was because there's this shadow event that takes place. <clears throat> now, the mountain itself is almost a perfect cone. So when the sun comes up over the Gulf of Mexico, it casts the shadow of the mountain over the western horizon. And this event only lasts for about 10 minutes. So let me share with you some media here. Here's our us ascending the Yamapa Glacier. It was very hard. It was like rock ice. Clouds coming in off the, looking east, clouds coming in off the Gulf of Mexico. And so here's a couple things going on here. This is looking west. So our date of the climb, I believe, was February 19th, 2019. This was also the largest moon of calendar year 2019 on this night. So when we were on the glacier early in the morning, we almost didn't need our headlamp because the moon was that bright. So this picture is looking west. That is the moon setting. So as we're seeing here, we're going to start to see shadows of the mountain that I'm standing on. You will see a mountain in the foreground. That is a mountain known as Malinch. That is, and that in the background, that is not the sun setting, that's the moon setting. And the largest mountain you see there, that is not a mountain, that's the shadow of the mountain that I'm standing on. And we'll see how this kind of progresses over time. So here's zoomed in, the foreground, there's Malinche. That's actually the moon setting, it just appears this way. And then once again, the shadow. And then at some point, you can see here, it becomes very distinct. So as the sun continues to come up over the east on the opposite horizon, it then this this shadow event changes and it really only lasts about 10 minutes. So now zooming into that same extent, we can see the definitive shadow of the mountain that we're on. We can say Malinch, the mountain to the right. And just above that, obviously we now see we confirmed it. That is not the sun, that's the moon. And Jason getting towards the upper part. <clears throat> That's a view inside the crater rim. The looking directly east, clouds rolling in off the Gulf of Mexico, and then looking down inside the crater of the volcano. Jason attaining the summit. Me at the summit. And then here's kind of a video to give you an idea. <clears throat> Thank you. 
there's the summit up there, and then looking down inside the crater rim. And so once we achieve the summit, this is a view down the other side of the mountain. And we'll notice there is a hut down at the very center there. And that's what we'll be climbing to, although it might, you see with the red top there, it might look close. It would take us about three and a half hours to get down to the bottom from here. So once achieving the summit, 18,491 feet, we took a few photos there before then proceeding down the backside of the mountain, which was fun to do because we did a traverse of the mountain, but the backside of the mountain was not only potentially unsafe, but as I showed in the photos here, it's very, this is all volcanic scree and ash and it gets everywhere. So by the time we made it down to the lodge, I had lost a good portion of sight in one of my eyes just strictly due to um, all the volcanic ash. There's Jason kind of coming out of the high country. And then just another time elapsed photos here of that sunrise event all looking the same way, the shadow event that happens at sunrise. We wanted to be really high up in the mountain to see that, but then also it would be very fortunate to have a super moon on the day that we were climbing it, setting in the background, like how lucky can you get really? And then another one of my favorite photos of Popo Setepetl venting off in the background. Okay, we're nearing the home stretch here on the last little bit. So thanks everyone who's hung in there with us. Um, so right before everything shut down, I had the opportunity to travel to Ecuador and climb the two highest points in that country. That's Cotopaxi and Chimborazo. Um, one of which was 19,000, the other was just, just over Denali, 20,000 feet. And that was in 2020, in January, 2020, right before, um, right before the whole world shut down. I'm just gonna share with you, we're not gonna go too in depth. I'll just share with you some media here and some cool things. In Ecuador, first off, how the heck do they have permanent glaciers on the equator? Weird, they have extremely high mountains there. <clears throat> and then this area, you see Quito there on the left-hand side through it's through Volcano Alley, they call it. And then drawing your attention to the right-hand side of the screen, every little dot you see there with white on top, those are all the volcanoes in Volcano Alley. So if you're in Quito, you're literally looking down this Volcano Alley and you can see it you're like, they, oh yeah, this is, that's why they call it Volcano Alley. <laughs> so the highest point in Ecuador is technically the closest point on earth to outer space. And the reason being is because the Earth is not a perfect sphere, it's an obloid sphere. So meaning that it bulges at the equator. So if you took any distance from the center of the Earth, the furthest away that you could possibly be is on the summit of Chimborazo in Ecuador. And so when we were there, they actually had this giant plaque certified by, um, certified by a couple different groups. And I'll share with you some of the, my favorite, just a few of my favorite media here. One, this is on code epoxy. Um, there's a phenomenon that happens called hoarfrost that basically turns you into a block of ice. So that's what you're seeing here. I'm literally covered in ice. Cool video um, of me on Cote Epoxy. Video is taken approximately somewhere around 19,200 feet. And as we scroll to the right, we'll notice the clouds rolling off the summit of the mountain. And the next one's taken from approximately 19,000 feet on Cotopaxi.
massive crevasses. And the crevasses on Cotopaxi also expunge a lot of sulfur and sulfuric acid. So it stinks on that mountain, and especially in the upper part. It reeks. And there's the plaque once again, certified the Institute of Geographic of France. And then this is on Chimborazo, so the highest point in the country. Um, it's really eerie because at base camp, there's about 60 graves like this. They're just plaques of, no one's actually buried there. They're just plaques. So like a lot of the people have died on the mountain, but a lot of people haven't. They're just, they wanted to be, have their tomb there in reverence of Chimborazo because they hold it in such high regard, but it is very eerie there going and being at base camp and seeing all these graves and I'm like, what am I getting myself into here? <laughs> and then there's a, a, us at the summit of Chimborazo, completely covered in hoarfrost. And it's just cool to note at this point in the photo, we are the closest thing on earth to the sun at this point in the photo. So kind of rounding things out here in the conclusion, thanks for hanging us with here, uh, hanging in us, hanging with us here. I'm going to touch on training. So this is kind of like what I draw it up at is. So I draw it up as I do about 12 weeks um, with my kind of eye on the prize. So we'll kind of go over the beginning, you know, week one through six approximately is strength and bulk period, you know, a lot of food, a lot of heavy weights, things like that. And then, you know, week six is six through Eight, six through nine, start ramping up the cardio, increasing the cardio in the blue period. And then in the yellow period, you need to have a peak. I like to have a peak performance period where I would do something like I, one time I went before Ecuador, I went to the gym and I walked the stair stepper for two and a half hours at a medium pace with like a 50 pound pack. So you got to do something big. And then you really wind it down over the last part with that two week mark kind of being your, your wind down period. And for me, I would just, I would like go to the gym. I would just stretch. I would like listen to some really relaxing music and then I would go sit in the sauna. And so like, if you don't want to do weights, don't do weights. Like you, the idea is, you know, like, like uh, marathon runners is you want to put yourself in that ultimate physical position that now I have to climb to the peak. You have this rebound effect. Train for your goal, whatever your goal is, run a marathon, climb a mountain, train for that. You're going to be in extreme cold weather, train in extreme cold weather. The rule of threes is something I also like to talk to people about. So the rule of threes goes something like this. Three minutes without oxygen, you can live. Three days without water, three weeks without food, and three months without any hope, utter no hope at all. So if you were stranded on a desert island and you were at you gave up all hope. You could go three months, according to the military, before technically you'd cross over some mental barrier. That being said, you're going to be fine. Okay? I don't like people stress over, well, what should I bring? Should I bring this? Oh, oh am I going to have enough of this, this, this? You know what? We're going to be fine. Settle down. <laughs> and fear is a great motivator if you let it be. Um, for me, fear of not summiting fear of dying are huge motivators. I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. and I'm going to run five miles and then I'm going to do squats. Uh, I'm going to squat 250 pounds this afternoon like because I don't want to die. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of my methodology there. And so in, you know, kind of what, what does the future look like for me? I, I, I don't know. I kind of ruled out doing the seven summits. I had thought about going to South America to do an Aconcagua, but then like you know, I'd love to make it to Himalaya or Pakistan, but then if you go to the Himalaya, you sign up for being gone anywhere between two to four months, you're gone. Um, I had originally pl climb, planned to climb Lhotse, which is the fourth highest mountain in the world and shares a base camp with Everest. So it's basically you go left for Everest, go right for Lhotse, but then you got to spend, <clears throat> you got to spend a month in the garbage dump of Mount Everest base camp. And really the only thing I'm committed to at this point is in 2032, I'd like to fly my family to uh, Africa. I will be 50 years old that year and we'll climb Kilimanjaro as a family. And then I will be done mountaineering. I'll move on to something else. 
Last but not least, the conclusion here, and I'd like to frame things up for, for everyone on the line. So <clears throat> what is your goal? And let me, let me put this in perspective of a mountaineering perspective. Is an unsuccessful summit attempt still considered a failure? At what point have you come so far that even if you were unsuccess unsuccessful, simply achieving that point was a great success all by itself? And I believe that we can apply this philosophy to everything in life. Research shows that people regret the things that they did not do more than the things that they did, even if the things that they did turned out badly, demonstrating that people's regrets follow a systematic time course. Action causes more pain in the short term, but inaction, inactions are regretted more in the long term. So if there's anyone on the line who's thinking about, you know, anything like this, the best advice I could give you is start now, start today. Thank you for listening. My, this has been True Stories of Adventure. My name is Mitch Winicky.